All right. So anyone who may have missed will be able to see. Okay, let's get started. Is everybody ready? Welcome, everyone. This is the first of two really wonderful panel webinars this week, and I'm honored. My name is Marina Grayson Farrell. I'm honored to be moderator on behalf of Bureau Works today, and we have a lovely, lovely two excellent sides of the equation. The, the person representing the globalization, localization as a leader for quite a few years, Ketel Jantra, a globalization leader from Silicon Valley. You've spent many years with Netflix as, oh my gosh, your, your list of credentials goes on quite a while here. <laughs> uh, language <laughs> program management, LATAM, APAC, vendor manager, language manager, on the board of women in localization. Head of localization at Box, Yahoo, my goodness, your your reputation precedes you. So welcome, Katel, so lovely to have you. And Thank have, you. Thank you very much, Marina. You bet. And, and a lot of experience from France and uh, representing that language and the localization, globalization side. And then also on the other side, the translation side, please welcome Adrian Probst. Did I say that correctly, Probst? Almost perfectly. <laughs> yeah, Probst and uh, yeah. the English to French, Swiss, Swiss-Deutsch German translator specializing, oh, in so many things and a really prolific content creator with an amazing YouTube channel, The Freelance Verse. So you've written a lot of content, you've spoken about how the translator can do better. And as a freelancer, it's wonderful to have your opinions here in this panel as well. Okay, so here we're gonna get started. This is the topic du jour, maybe, of all the day. Uh, the most important topic, perhaps, the future, the future of translation. And translation, I can tell you've said it before, translators are so important for what we do. Localization would not exist without the translator. So the specific topic today, keeping translation alive in this age of work downturns and AI. Two things happening about the same time. We've had some variations of these but now it's really coming together. And, you know, we rely on the translators. So the fundamental bridge and what we know, you who are translators, you're experts at the cultural side, you're experts with the specific terminologies. You have all this in your brains, but we have a way that's coming, that's changing. How are we gonna deal with that? How are we gonna deal with work that wasn't the same, the workflows are different, and there's a completely different kind of scary technology coming at us. And we also want to emphasize that human translators are unique. So there's gonna be a lot to dig into. So I hope I've introduced these two wonderful minds to this stage. And as I said before, please put your questions for Q&A portion we're gonna do at the end. Please put those in the chat. So, Katel and Adrian, here it is. We know the importance. We know the translation process is the bridge that connects, allows our projects to proceed. And we're worried about job layoffs and we're worried about AI. Let's talk about what is it about the human translators that bring to that translation process? I'll start with Adrian. We just talked the other day and you, sir, you have an opinion that's formed on working on the files and you've done a lot in your career to keep going. Can you talk about what it is that the human brings. Yeah, sure. Thanks for inviting me. First of all, it's an honor to be here. Um, uh, it's it's a of course it's a very interesting topic to talk about with with you two today. Um, 
to yeah to to think about as well obviously we don't have all the answers but it's the number one topic i get asked on the on the youtube channel as well in my comments people are worried people especially this year i feel like there has been a a huge momentum in, gained in in ai technology but i think it's also important to to look at it from a translator's perspective what actually changed and when you look at it from a, like an overall perspective, not that much changed with the, with the birth of, of generative AI for translators. Of course, it will have an impact once it's, it's uh, integrated into certain tools. I, I know that BureauWorks is working on one. And uh, so this is, we are heading in that direction, but it's important to know that, you know, neural machine translation has been around for now, what, seven, eight years. Uh, that doesn't mean that suddenly now with ChatGPT everything is different, right? It's it's we have been working in this workflow with with the human in the loop for almost a decade now. I think actually our sector is is uh, kind of an early adopter in that sense, so we have to use that to our advantage. Um, in terms of what the human brings, I mean, you you hit the nail on the head when you mentioned connecting cultures. I think that is one of the the main aspect that we can bring um, now that the, the field is heading more and more into, into this a, age of AI, um, we need to find value propositions that, that we can offer to our clients that is more than a machine can do, right? And that's not easy, uh, but focus solely on, on exceptional language skills, linguistic skills will not be enough anymore. And one aspect that you have uh, mentioned correctly is the the uh, relevance of cultural competencies and this is something of course you can you can learn at university in a way I mean we have been taught uh, culture classes that uh, but you know you're not going to learn the necessary skills if you do this once or two one or two hours a week right that's not enough so uh, this is something you learn by immersing yourself in cultures by by uh, gaining experience in the field. So, of course, I know this is very uh, simplified. You have to know cultural competencies. That, that's not an easy uh, task to or an easy skill to acquire, but I think it will be one of the most important in the future. Oh, yes. Very good. The skill set that you have already and then you keep coming back and enhancing and adding to your skills and then cultural competency those are really good points okay great thank you thank you so then can tell on the globalization localization fire side you're the one who is getting those projects going and very mindful of expense and scope and all that even all that aside, what what's your take on on this, the human side? Yeah, I, so I, you know, I, I'm not going to have necessarily a, a very different opinion from uh, from what Adrian says. Um, uh, I, I think, you know, what you talked about in terms of, of cultural uh, adaptation, cultural uh, understanding context, for me, is still remains at the core of what a human translator brings. Um, it's, um, you know, you have, I think all the noise that we are hearing now and huge caveat here, I am not an expert in AI. I am not, you know, uh, I haven't really actively worked with this, but I've, I've, I've seen, you know, I've talked to quite a few people uh, uh, about this, including people who are actively um, uh, testing, piloting, you know, this, uh, this technology. I think uh, a lot of the noise we're hearing about this is because, you know, uh, uh, chat GPT, of course, is there, is accessible by everybody. Um, and, and beyond translation, you know, it's like this, well, it's artificial intelligence that you can talk to. You can actually use language to interact with as opposed to, um, to something where a, a programmer has to enter prompts. You can do it as a, as a, a layman. You can actually do this. So, so this, this touches on something very different to people. It touches really on the core of what your, uh, um, uh, what makes you human? It's language and culture, and and so that that speaks very much to to people. Um, I, I do think, however, that um, if you think about um, what buyers in the localization space are looking for, yes, they're going to look to streamline things, uh, save money if possible, be more efficient, but also be impactful. Um, you know, it needs to fit the purpose. 
um, if your if your purpose is to relate to people emotionally, culturally, uh, is that going to be enough? I think one of the issues with ChatGPT is that it is. Um, it is mimicking what humans uh, are, are saying. Uh, it's doing the very cleverly, but it's mimicking what other people have said. Uh, it's unclear to me if uh, if the data that is fed, uh, which pretty much with ChatGPT is like the internet from two years ago, uh, you know, is it is it only original content, as in written in that original language, or was it translated? So you could say whether well, that's that's mimicking something that people have already translated or not. So it's a little bit unclear here. And and if you think about a an enterprise enterprise implementation with an API, uh, because of the uh, the concerns around privacy, um, you're going to need to make sure that you you don't have that access to the internet and and your data doesn't go you know where you don't want it to go, which means that. Uh, on one hand, you're going to have something that is more tailored to your solution, which is great, but you're going to lose maybe some of the context uh, that, that is needed in order to do that. Um, so, uh, and that context, I think, is something that uh, the, the new uh, uh, large language models are very good at. Um, uh, but, you know, it depends how much freedom you, you're going to give them to have access to that context. A human translator has that that context, uh, not naturally, because it does take work, and but it's something that they will absorb, you know, uh, as part of uh, their their background, their uh, their culture, uh, their history, and so uh, they have this. And in the same way that if you have a translator who's been uh, living in a country for outside of their home, their native uh, language country, for a very long time, like I have, uh, you lose that cultural context you can still speak the language and you will still you know be able to interact that's not really an issue but as soon as you go into the the more specific of of what makes you know a language alive and constantly evolving you will lose this it doesn't matter how, how good a, a translator you are i've recently had an interaction with uh, uh with a friend around uh the, the tagline for the new barbie movie and apparently it's hilarious in french because he uses an expression that completely bypassed me because i have no idea i left france too long ago and i'm like, i don't know what that expressions mean and for me it wasn't funny so that's the kind of stuff that you lose if you have it so so that's a little bit how i think of of the AI, if you don't give them access to that information, they're not going to be able to do to do the best job possible. Um, so that that context, that cultural context, for me is is really something that that remains at the core of what humans uh, are. Uh, whether or not the machine will be able to get there in an enterprise, you know, setting. Um, I don't know. I suspect it will at some point. Um, and this is also why I think about, you know, AI as something that we should um, more or less try to embrace as much as possible and think about the ways that we can find it useful in the work that we do and not try to just, you know, push it away and ignore it because it's it's not going to disappear and go away. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh very interesting and especially in the light of uh if the ai tool has the is embedded in an api and it's served up as a tool i think adrian you had a chance recently to see that you know in, in bureauworks for example so if it's offered as a choice and you can make the human makes the choice and dismisses the words that they don't want and accepts the words that they do want so that's the preferred way to go about it. I think it was interesting, Katel, you said the other day, uh, and it was interesting how a translator who might not necessarily know the topic very well may be having some error in the words they choose. So they can hallucinate. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you know, we, we've been using the word hallucinate to talk about uh, what the AI makes up, basically. Um, and I, I didn't coin this, obviously. Uh, and But I, I do think about it in a way that, uh, you know, I, I, I used to be a translator. I, I started my career as a translator. And so uh, I've translated, I've reviewed work of others, and I'm sure I have you know, myself, you know, uh, delivered some pieces of translation that were not perfect. And, and as a translator, the more you know about your subject, 
uh, the better you're going to be because you're going to have a confidence about what you are doing. You might be able to take certain slight liberties within, you know, within the rule of the of the specs of the the projects that you're given. And you can only do this if you uh, if you know your your uh, if you know your topic uh, in depth. If you don't, and if you're a little bit lazy. And I've seen more than one lazy translation by, by human translators. You're going to take some shortcuts. You maybe not going to check, or you're going to check, but you because you don't have that full understanding of the topic, you're going to maybe pick the wrong solution. And and you end up with things that sometimes don't make sense. And this is why I said, you know, well, maybe that's similar to to uh, to your LLM hallucinating because you know it's like. What are you talking about? This is not this is not on topic. So I, I I do think about it like this, and and we shouldn't we shouldn't think that just because people are human versus the machine that they don't make mistakes. I mean, machines are very good at being consistent, for instance, that humans are not. So there's plenty of good things with with working with machines in in the language uh, industry, in my view. Oh my goodness, that that is an interesting yeah, interesting thought, Adrian. What do you? You're yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I completely agree. It's 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 funny and interesting how we are like, kind of in, in every webinar at every conference, we have to kind of defend the human translator, right? And we <laughs> put him on the pedestal. Yeah, yeah he's, he's infallible. He's so good wow. and uh, will we'll always be needed, the skills. But I mean, we also have to look at the weaknesses, right? We get tired. I mean, it's it's tiring to translate it. It can be very exhausting if you have a lot of uh, work on one day and yeah. mistakes happen that is one thing that's that's not too bad but on the other hand it also just has to be said that there are extremely many bad translators out there as well right because oh, yeah. the, the barrier of entry into this sector is not that hard right it's not like realistically you don't need any kind of certification degree if you find your way into the industry you can you can make it right so it, i think it's important to also understand that that not every translator will survive this uh, shift into the age of AI. And that's, in a way, that's okay for everyone who's here, because everyone who's here is obviously working on themselves and, uh, you Good know, point. wanting to improve. And yes. uh, so that's, <laughs> I think it's it's also a chance for people who take it more seriously that uh, the industry gets um, higher standards, higher um, quality standards which is very important in a way anyways. But what I've seen also, I mean, I haven't noticed a shift into like post editing in my workflow, but I've heard from many people that it has happened. And uh, Katel, you mentioned laziness. And I noticed people have told me that kind of uh, post editing can trigger this kind of laziness, you know, this not in a way that someone is lazy, but just this, I mean, it's good enough, you know, it's already there. I'm not paid enough, so why should I even change that? You know, the client wants me to post it, so I'm just going to leave it there. And I feel like it can lead to lower quality content. And that is something that both the translator and the buyer doesn't want. So it's, mm -hmm. I think there is an important uh, um, like question there. Like, is it really less work for a translator? Does, is it justifiable to pay him or her or them that much less that some people get, you know, because I've heard that post editing can take almost the same time as translating from scratch as well. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with this. I, I think this is something that I've seen and you, a lot of you may have experienced uh, where, you know, uh, the, the the recommendation from from the machine uh, might be good enough. Um, and I think for a lot of purpose, uh, it might be fine, like good enough might be perfectly yeah. fine for for the, the end use. Um, but um, I think especially in the creative space, it is uh, it can be a detriment. Um, and again, you know, it will vary on what the use case is. But uh, I, I can see how um, having something that looks fine or good enough uh, will maybe hinder the creativity uh, and and. Uh, that applies to post editing in, in the in the classical sense of machine machine translation, but also maybe with some of the new use cases that we are seeing with uh, with AI around content creation. If you are if you are given a, a prompt um, and uh, and the machine creates you know copy, 
Uh, so it's, it's no longer a translation, it's a copy created from, from a prompt, from a brief. Um, you know, is that, and, and it's supposed to be creative, um, is that really, I mean, it's, I would argue it's not, again, it's not creation, it's kind of mimicking uh, what's been done before. Um, so is that, and you're given to it, and okay, as a copywriter, you, you, you need to improve on it, is that going to um, incite you to actually be a little lazier and say, well, that this is fine, you know, it, it, it's okay. Like, um, so having that starting point may or may not be uh, the right thing. I mean, this is part of the whole conversation that's happening right yeah. now in Hollywood with the with the script, script writers, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I could see how that would really be um, I, that would actually stop people from from really looking for something else and and find uniqueness in the in the work that they are doing. So that that's a concern that I have personally, uh, especially if you are uh, working in the creative space. Uh, that could be a great tool in terms of productivity uh, and, and and efficiency. But is that going to fit the bill if you really need to be uh, uh, creative? So that's that's a question. I don't have an answer, but I could see some issues with that. That okay, now that's interesting because yeah, that's that's even apart from using a suite of tools and it works inside there because when it's working inside, you bring it up and you just go ahead with your work. Now, if you're called on to do the creative part, okay, that, that's interesting. So now we're talking about what do we do? What is the next step? And the way I was thinking was along the lines of preserving. Uh, there was this wonderful article by Corinne McKay talking about his translation, a dying profession. And that kind of thought uh, kind of led to the idea of this panel. What do we do? We have to be alive and thriving in, in, in all of our work. But then talking about translation, preserve, actually, Cattell, you thought adapt is a more appropriate term. So thinking about that, what do we do to adapt, keeping this wonderful industry alive, this process? In my mind, I was thinking, I'm always thinking of skill, you know, getting training, always foremost, uh, getting reskilling. If you're, you know, an advanced worker who has all these skills, you've got to adapt and learn what's the new set of tools. What's your thoughts on that? Adrian? Um, okay. Or could tell. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, uh, I think adapt is the keyword here. I think it's, um, the, the, when you think about why you're afraid of something, it's mostly because you uh, don't know how it works, right? That's kind of the, the, the reason behind fear is something you don't know. Um, and I, I encourage everyone to to learn as much as possible always about about AI, about NMT and how it works. You don't need to know specifics, but you just need to know the basics. So you actually can have a conversation like we do today. We're all not IT experts, right? But at least we can talk about it and we can find solutions, um, which does not mean, by the way, I'm not saying at all that everyone should uh, be fully on board with AI and excited about all its aspects. Not at all. That is... I think it's good and healthy to be skeptical in a way and to be cautious. I mean, some of the most influential tech people in the world are are being cautious and are requesting more regulation with it, right? Because no one knows where it where it could be going and where it is going. the The one thing that we know is that it will stay because it is. Uh, I mean, billions are being poured into it, so it makes sense that the the development will be exponential and will be extremely uh, quick. But the development does not mean that the adoption will be that quick, right? I think people are still very, very cautious. Uh, AI behavior can be weird sometimes. It can be un uncanny for humans. So, and of course, it's it's connected to huge costs, right? For a company, if they want to actually uh, adopt uh, um, an AI system in their in their current workflow, that is unbelievable costs at the moment. So. Um, we do have time to get on board in a way. So that's uh, when everyone is here. So people are learning about it, which is great. Um, yes. And then other things that we can do is, you know, focus on our creativity, uh, try to get into, into sectors where um, there is a lot at stake, like premium content, where 
where uh, using NMT or AI is not even a question because people just can't afford it, right? If if you have if you have texts that are consumer facing to millions of people, it just it's not even in the in the conversation with some of my clients that I have, right? Because sometimes I spend uh, two hours on one sentence, or even with a with a whole team. You know, it's it's there are there is definitely premium content where it's not even a conversation yet. Let's say it might be a conversation once or soon, uh, but of course, I mean, content is duplicating at a crazy speed, so it's normal that uh, for a lot of noise content, this is. Uh, uh, AI and NMT implementation makes sense and should also be used, as Katel said, for some use cases, good enough is enough. And our job is it to excel in these premium markets where um, the human touch is just needed, or not even the human touch, but just human production in general. Um, that's what I focus on, plus what I always preach on my channel is don't be afraid to to branch out, don't you're not just a translator, right? You are you are a freelance linguist, you're a freelance language professional. Uh, there is so much else I do within this um, or under this umbrella. Um, translation has become maybe thirty percent of what I do, and I think that's something where people put themselves into a box too often. Um, we talked yesterday, Marina, that there is a, a extreme. Uh, professional pride amongst translators, which is nice, right? I like this, this dynamic, but it can hinder some people, you know, uh, they identify so strongly with this, with this job title. And it's very likely that the job title might change, you know, it has the job title hasn't changed. But when you think about what a translator was 30 years ago, or 60 years ago, it has changed many times over time, and it will change again. And I think this fear of that you will just be wiped out, that is only a fear if you are in the in the segment where you don't really work on yourself, you're coasting, you don't uh, take this seriously, and I don't think we have to worry about that. Mm, very good. I, that was a, a I don't know if that answered <laughs> your question, but That's it's good. all that came to mind. <laughs> oh, I think there's a, a lot of really good value in all of that, and and especially the 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 nudge to be creative. Everybody, come up with creative solutions with it, and take care of yourself, and and you know do do the best you can and explore. So, Katel, forgive me. I I the question came from our original discussion. I wanted to hear Adrian's translator side. So, for you on the buyer side your reaction to what he said and this question mm -hmm. about adapting what's your thought yeah no i i i agree i think uh, uh we're aligned there uh, the, the cost the cost question i think is a really interesting one uh, uh to have brought up because uh it's true in the same way that you know with the traditional mt uh solutions uh you should not try to apply mt everywhere there's a cost uh, associated with it um and it might not make sense uh for some small organization or organizations where mt might not be a good fit for for the work to actually do this now i do believe that um uh, ai and and the new uh, large language models have a uh, the price tag associated with it are much lower than it is with the traditional mt implementations but still there is a price tag there that people have to to think about and unless they want to go down the the chat gpt route which i kind of in my head associate although it's not a, an exact match with you know uh, using google translate instead of of, uh, of an enterprise uh, mt solution uh that's there's going to be a cost there so so it might not be for uh for everybody uh, as far as um you know adaptability uh i, I agree totally uh, i think uh, this is something that uh, uh people will need to know i think the the piece that is really uh, worth preserving is is really that uh, that deep knowledge of the culture uh, and and the language, uh, which I think is is something that is really unique to to human still. Um, but otherwise, uh, adapting is is very important, and and curiosity I think uh, will, will be very important. I see there's a question there in in the chat um, uh, from Julien or Julian. Uh, uh, it's I, I I would say if if you can try to be proactive about it, uh, and what I mean by if you can is that if you are in a position where you can engage with your customer, 
uh, whether it's an LSP or uh, or a direct customer or a, bu a buyer, um, you know, ask the questions, ask if they are thinking about these things, and and if if um, if customers offer you uh, uh, work uh, that touch, you know, with working with with AI. Uh, I would say be curious and say, yeah, okay, I'll try it. I've never done it, but I'll try it and experience it for yourself uh, um, and see how it works, what doesn't work, and uh, and providing feedback for this kind of stuff will be uh, will be very interesting. Uh, Adrian was right. I think there's still a lot of people who are very cautious about uh, implementing, you know, AI solutions, um, but it is also coming. Um, and uh, and I think there's going to be it's going to be that pendulum where everybody gets super excited about it and then realize oh that doesn't quite work for my for my needs so going back and and that's going to be a bit of whiplash uh, uh, around this for a while but I think if you are in in those discussions it's a better place to be than being outside and and not wanting to be part of it because you can be part of finding you know that solution if you are part of that conversation so that that's how I, I think about it like try to be proactive if you can hmm. Excellent. And, and being proactive and joining in, you know, when, when I remember when translation memory was new and oh my gosh, this is it. We're not going to be able to do any work, you know, and, and this is different because there's a much bigger scale and there's much more coming from this. Uh, but I think, you know, and it's not, and it's not just translation. Like if you think about it, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. you know, pro programming jobs are yes. probably going to be impacted, yes. which, which is a place where people thought, Ooh, that those, there's always going to be need for, for programmers and, and they will be. And if you talk to a programmer, they will probably tell you, well, you still actually, I have spoken to programmers about this. And the feeling is that, well, you still need people to review the code and fix all the bugs and the AI cannot do this yet. I don't know what will happen. Huh. So again, you yes. know, but, but people are starting to think uh, uh, it's not just the language translation industry. Yes. It's, it's, um, you know, a lot of white collar jobs that are being, you know, impacted by, by this. Yeah, absolutely. So wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you know, be curious, you know, that's the old wonderful saying and keep involved and find out what you can. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, excellent. And, and Julian says, merci. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Now we'll come back to the Q and A here in a little bit. The, the track that we're going here with preserving, adapting the strengths of the translator and understanding context, emotional, cultural nuance. Uh, then when you get into the collaborative part, and, and it's interesting that you were saying, Katel, you were saying translators need to be uh, adapting kind of consciousness, curious about technology, can't be passive. And Adrian, you've already said that quite a bit. You can't be passive about these, these issues. You have to be a part of it. And training AI, even in the bigger models and the bigger scope of things, making sure bias isn't baked in because whoever was handling it was a certain, you know, whatever narrow segment of the population. I think it's going to be interesting to keep everyone keep involved in these things. So one thing that came around from our conversation, Katel, you were saying about uh, making sure there's a brief that's created. And I recall when I'd worked in the corporate world, it always seemed to be the best results would come from having some kind of guidelines, something uh, created so that, you know, brand, uh, anything required within the brand, within terminology, whatever is preferred words, something that's used as the most important words captured in keywords, whatever. And we put those into a guideline before the translation process even starts so that the translator has a fair shot at what you're looking for. And, you know, basically if you just give them, you know, here's the project, go for it. They have not much understanding of what you require. So I believe you were using the word brief. Am I stating that correctly about your thought about having something for the translator to use? Can you talk yeah, I, I think the context, 
I think the context of this was around uh, content creation rather than um, uh, and, and content creation. I put this in, you know, in, in quotation mark because uh, it's it's kind of content recreation. So if you think and especially I'm talking more in the creative space. So if you think about marketing slogans, you know, this kind of stuff, like where copywriting is is uh, heavily needed. Um, the way that it's been done uh, traditionally, and not only, I mean, there are, you know, plenty of, uh, of, of companies where um, if you have like a global campaign, you're going to recreate completely different uh, slogans for it and make sure that it matches, you know, the, uh, the purpose for that market, for that audience. Uh, but there's also a lot of, well, we created in English or source language most of the time English and then you know we send it to uh, localization so you charge a little more because it's marketing rates but you know at the end of the day you kind of stuck with whatever the English was to some extent and that concept you know now if you think of using AI uh, in a way where you can speed up that process and instead of um, having a, a waterfall uh, model you you instead use that brief um, uh, I mean, th that English copy was written because somebody created a brief and said, what, are, what do we want to achieve? What is the tone of what uh, of the message that we want to deliver? Um, and, you know, a lot of other information. And then you have creative people who think about how they can they can voice this copywriters. There's going to be you know, a lot of back and forth and writing that line of copy. I mean, Ali, was talking about um, uh, you know, like two days spend on it. Sometimes they might spend two months on that one line and you get like a day if you're lucky or two or something like that. So that those there's an imbalance there. So if you take that brief and if you tell, you know, uh, uh, the AI where recreate something that fits, you know, the purpose of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a line of copy in France or in Germany or in Spain or in Japan, um, then that may or may not work. That brief will maybe have to be rethought uh, because that mm -hmm. concept, you may have to take another step back and say, okay, we're trying to deliver generally that message, but that message might not resonate with somebody in Japan, while it might resonate to, with somebody in Spain. So I, I, the way that I'm thinking about this is that I think for, especially in that space, the creative space, um, the localization work uh, is not necessarily going to be done at the copywriting level but much earlier you know in the process and this is where I think the skills can become very interesting and again that cultural understanding uh, of that 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 cultural context becomes very very important because you can have the conversation as a, a linguist or language professional Adrien was was using the word um to to say no that's that's not going to work so you know that concept we need to think about it we need to adapt it in a different manner so i think that's uh, that's what i was thinking although my my thoughts around this tend, tend to shift quite quite a lot on a daily basis so today that's what i'm thinking <laughs> that's good that's a good answer <laughs> very good and and that's yeah that's what i was curious about from our conversation the other day so Adrian, then we had the same conversation, you and I. And so talking about this, uh, you know, preparation ahead of time and, and, you know, having some kind of guidelines and that kind of thing. And, and now that I'm thinking about it, the next point on the list of notes I had, the collaboration, because, you know, we all don't work independently. We bring people together, a team and so forth, and we, we work together. And that seems to be key is collaborating in this innovation. What are, what are your thoughts there, Adrian? Yeah, definitely. Before I move to that, I want to add something quickly to what Katel said that is uh, so true. Like the localization can take place even before the text is even written, right? And that is something that uh, that's one of this, these creative ways that we can uh, shift our, or not shift our skills, but reinvent our, our services and skill set. And that's what I've been doing as well. I'm, I've been offering language consultancy, for example, for companies that um, are, you know, like um, uh, going into the Swiss market and they want to talk to me first in terms of uh, what what terminology to use, how to address the Swiss audience, etc. And this localize this is localization, but it's not in the translation process. It's beforehand, right? 
and that is exactly what some all of you here can can offer as well right if you if you know a lot about your own culture and your own uh, language this is something you can offer and for me having the the swiss background that helps a lot of course because um still many companies think yeah, we can just uh, use the same the same tone of voice as we use for germany or austria but that's not going to end well right uh, swiss people want to be addressed very differently than german people and it, there is a slight difference but if you read it as a swiss person you will always know that this is not written for you and that's of course a, a huge selling point for me i can i can make this clear to my clients very easily um, in terms of what we talked about, Mariana, yesterday, but we we misunderstood Katel's brief a little bit, right? Uh, uh, what oh, what we got it what now. I yeah yeah we got it now. What I took from this, and that actually came just to my mind uh, while we were talking yesterday. One way to collaborate um, with AI in a cut tool, let's say, could be that you know one of the most tedious tasks that we have is to read through like 50 pages of style guides and hundreds hundreds of entries in an excel for like a glossary or something and still you don't get the consistency right because it's just almost impossible and if we could feed all this information all this brief somehow in a, in an ai and then in a cut tool you would have kind of a chatbot on the side imagine that would be so useful you could just ask it basically Hey, what's the? How do I write the, the formatting for currency for this client? And it would tell you what, what is the form of address for Germany. And, and so, the, I could really see the collaborative approach with an AI chatbot while you're working in a in a cat tool. I haven't seen that. I don't know if it works. How this would work? Uh, this is just an idea that I had. Um, I like that a lot. That's, I think that's hey, we, idea, right? Yeah. That's a that could be. Writing a memo right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's very so yeah, like this, uh, an implementation into the localization tools can be not only uh, um, a danger, but definitely also a challenge, uh, uh, not only a challenge, but also an opportunity for us, I would say. Oh, and isn't that the famous, you know, hexagram of, you know, danger, <laughs> challenge, it's all one the same. It's all the same, yeah. And danger, and, you know, it makes it exciting and, you know, it, let's move forward and do some exciting things, you know, but being mindful of what we need to do to take care of ourselves. So uh, we're getting close to needing to wrap up, getting into the Q and A. We have a oh. couple of questions here. I love this flow of conversation. We're getting- Yeah, it went so quickly. <laughs> I know, it goes <laughs> amazingly fast. I think we covered everything that we hoped to, and now let's look to see. Oh, Mariana, thanks for your question. Here we go. Let's see. Training data. Did we talk about this? Training data sets for types of tools are huge, millions of words. I wonder about questions that do not have as much literature as tier one languages in the internet. If we are still having issues with language like Spanish, French, Chinese, we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Does that do you? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure I have um, a, a lot of clever things to say about this. I, I, I think you're right. Um, it's, you know, the, the, the AI, the machine is trained with data that is available. Um, for some languages, it's going to be a lot more difficult to get, you know, a lot of data, and especially original language data as opposed to translated data. Um, so that that's going to make it uh, a lot more difficult. Uh, which could be a great opportunity for people to provide those languages because they probably still have a, a bit of time, you know, uh, um, you know, to to adapt and and find uh, and find their way through. Um, but yeah, so I mean, for obvious reasons, um, you know, the 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 top languages will get more attention. Uh, there's more data, there's more need for those languages, just because there's more people who speak it and, and consume it. Um, so I think that uh, we, we're going to see the same things, you know, in the same way that uh, the localization industry still struggles with, you know, uh, localizing into um, African languages or indigenous languages, uh, that's going to be um, uh, something similar where it's going to take a lot more time to actually catch up with, with that. Uh, beyond that, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Adrian, maybe uh, you have some, uh, some thoughts about that. No, it's exactly what you say. It just takes that much longer, the, the fewer uh, data sets you have. 
there's actually now an in interesting experiment or not even experiments already uh, out in a beta version. Uh, Text Shuttle is a company from Zurich, from Switzerland. They created the first Swiss German uh, translation engine, which is really funny because there is not <laughs> there is no written language of Swiss German, right? But somehow they managed to yeah. to do that. Yeah, it's it's working surprisingly well. well. You can even choose the the different dialects and stuff. So you don't actually need that much data. It's of course you it, a lot, but when you think of data like the amounts that people are talking about, you can't even imagine. Uh, so millions of words is actually not that much, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. this is a data set you have rather quickly. So um, of course, it's nowhere near the level that you could actually use it to publish it, like with other tier one uh, languages, but it's coming, it's just taking more time. Mm. Interesting, yeah. And, and you know, in, in the way translation had proceeded in some companies just take French for France and change a few words to make it Canadian really you know or change the spelling seriously and and just the way uh, this the processes had been done badly you know just imagine every, everybody's on their best behavior and does them correctly because you've got this push now you've got a tool we've got to really get this really excellent level so i think things will be yes and and i think to this point uh, marina i think you know sometimes it's fine to um to just change the spelling or, or tweak a few things you don't necessarily need to to reinvent everything depending on what the use is you know and the impact you wanted yes. to have you, you might not need to do this one thing the the i may bring is that it, it, it might allow you to actually do more uh, with less, you know, there's uh, ever more content created, and and companies cannot afford to actually localize everything. So, will AI bring you know new ways of actually getting that content uh, to people? Um, that that might also be interesting. Like if you think, well, instead of just uh, I don't I don't I have limited budget, so my normal way to go to do like a, a Canadian version and a, and a French version is that I'm going to change, you know, uh, a few words. Um, well, maybe the AI now is allowing me to do a little more and rewrite things, you know, more, um, which maybe will be beneficial to uh, to the end user uh, and won't necessarily impact very much uh, the, the translator uh, because you may or may need somebody to still, you know, check that or to write those guidelines or you know make sure that that things run smoothly so there, there are things i think we're going to see different things pop up like this which uh we may not have really thought about or or they haven't had a use case until then because we were limited but what we could do on the budget we had oh yeah absolutely and and yeah you're doing what you can with the budget you have absolutely okay let's see there's a question here from raga do you how do you think continued AI adoption will affect translator rates? Will we need to create packages that offer multiple language services, translation, proofreading, dubbing, et cetera, to charge premium prices? Adrian, what do you think? That sounds like a nice idea, yeah? Why not? You can try that. <laughs> I have been experimenting with that, like offering the whole package to a to a client that is uh, I'm working now with a with a subtitling, like a publishing company that works on documentary in the in the Nordics. And there I basically get the 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 video, the raw format, and I uh, do the whole localization process and I send it back with imprinted subtitles. So that is a, a whole package that I work with other people with, for example. And there, of course, you can you can charge premium prices because you are taking a lot of uh, of their their work from them, right? They don't have to deal with anything, not even project management, basically. And then you're just charging. I think there needs to be kind of a mindset shift that we are just charging as service providers. It's not like we have to try to, you know, uh, offer some uh, prof possibly the lowest price amongst thousand applicants to just to get the job right I mean you don't do that when you go to the dentist or whatever and I, I, I like to make this kind of <laughs> case that you are just charging what you are charging if the client doesn't want it they can move on of course this is this takes time until you can actually negotiate with a client like that but that's kind of the goal where you want to go uh, and otherwise, if you don't want to offer uh, packages, you, as I said, you need to be in a 
position where you can work in premium markets where the translator is needed and valued and uh, where clients basically just accept your prices and you move on that's that's it is possible uh, it is definitely like we we referenced Corinne's article is translation a dying business and in this article she mentioned that many people reach out to her and saying that the rates are dropping they don't find jobs anymore uh, but then she said that she is heading into the most successful year so far since she is starting, yeah. right? And the same with me, just May last month was my most uh, lucrative month so far. So it, they, it's definitely possible to grow a translation business. It's really hard to say how. I don't really know how. I don't have any kind of secret special tip for everyone, but um, creativity, determination, adapting, and branching out right don't don't sit in your office and wait for jobs to come in it's not oh enough anymore you need to you need to try and and go after the work yourself oh my gosh absolutely and being creative you, yeah so look at adrian's youtube channel you'll get a few clues there that's very mm -hmm. good all right so let's see very good Oh, let's see. Alejandro, as the linguist works in one of the most crowded languages in the whole industry, Spanish, the use of MT is only tightened rates and competition. Do you think AI will go down that same exact way? Well, I mean, I, I can take I mean, this is related to the to the previous question, of course. Um, I, I, I think it's likely, to be honest, but I think just like Adrian's just said, uh, you you need to shift the way that you think about this. If you are still, um, if you are sticking to the way that things have been done, and and the new tools that are coming are actually compressing, you know, your margin and and driving the rates down, then yes, most likely new technology would do that because new technology is there for to uh, improve efficiency. Uh, lower cost and hopefully get you uh, a better, uh, a better, a higher impact at the end. You know, businesses are there to make money. They're not, and the more money they make, the happier they are. You know, so it's it really you need to to think about that. So, but if you think uh, about this in a in a way where you look for skills that are more unique, more human, and and more sought after, then you are able to charge premium or or you will be able to avoid being stuck in that restrictive, you know, carcan that, that, that is becoming like, okay, let's let's shrink the rates, 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 and that, that's all you want to talk about. So if you're stuck there, you it's not going to get better in my view. But if you think about, you know, Adrian was talking about um, uh, whole packages, uh, like you are able to do this, Adrian, because you've trained yourself or you've, you've taken some classes, whatever, and you know how to do these things, but it, it did require an investment on your part to do that. And that's probably how you need to think about this, like having different skills of language consultancy and things that allow you to become, to, to remain relevant. Uh, in in that process, um, so I, I I don't see this as as being. I think it's a shift in how you think about your skills, and and how you should really try to expand those skills. Um, if you if you remain in the, doing the same way, the the same thing, always the same way you might not be in control and somebody else will tell you well this is what we pay and this is you know this is how it is um it's still very new and people are trying to figure it out you know on the translation side on the buyer side the lsps the lsps are there to make a, a profit margin as well so you know uh, all these things uh come into play if you are able to offer more uh then you will be able to charge more that's that's how i think about it hmm. Nice. Yeah, Spanish is unfortunately a very uh, special case. Almost all my my complaints that I get on YouTube is about Spanish. I, I don't know where you're from, Alejandro, but what I've seen the most successful and and uh, most on top people in Spanish they they highly specialize even in regional Spanish. You know, if you are from I don't know Bolivia, Spain, Argentina, really focus on that niche. Say that you are the expert for this local, and then within that, even more find your very very niched specialization uh, that's how you can how you can excel because there are just too many spanish translators it is a fact so uh, 
really think what is your unique selling point right are you from south of spain is there some kind of regionalism you can you can play into are you from the north are you from south america so find what makes you unique what you are better in than most other people and then really play into that and market yourself as an expert in that oh yeah i've seen freelancers do these amazing marketing outlays and just you know making identifying what's unique about you be unique be something different, offer something a little bit different, and then really hone in on that and then really highlight that. And it's when you think about it that way, it could be a wonderful time, again, of exploration and, you know, putting yourself out there, which I think we said earlier for translators, is that a little bit of a difficult thing? I, I remember when I was in the corporate world, we were not really, uh, let's see, what, how shall I say, uh, encouraged to be active in social media or to have a side gig or whatever. So I felt like, oh, I can't really write this content, but I want to so much. Once I did that, all kinds of opportunities have come to me. And I know that's happened for all of us. So I, I think that's those are good things to, to really emphasize, especially as we're wrapping up here. It's like, how do we find the optimism side? Everything is so negative and so difficult, but can we see what everything we talked about today and find some optimism somewhere? And, and it's interesting, I see uh, another question, Boriana, hello, Boriana. She, her question is, do you think that the field would become even less popular among younger professionals? Interesting. That's an interesting one. Be. Um, Seems to be a trend go for ahead. that, yeah, unfortunately. No, no, you go. Oh, I, I was just going to say, um, uh, so I, you know, I, I cannot really speak for, for young professionals, because clearly I'm um, way past that. But um, I, what, I, what I've heard from Adrian here around, um, uh, you know, uh, offering different skills, um, I think if, if I were to start in the industry, I would find that a lot more exciting. Uh, if I'm able to uh, to work, for instance, you know, on subtitles and provide like, you know, the whole package, the whole finished product uh, to to a customer, uh, I would find that more exciting than than just working on flat files and, you know, and delivering, you know, work like that. So that's maybe something that can be uh, exciting. I hope that um, uh, schools um, you know, teach, you know, localization and translation, uh, think about it in that way, that they think about stuff like language consultancy um, and really bringing um, the excitement back to this. Because I think if you think of uh, the younger generation, like using all these tools, especially audiovisual and stuff like that, uh, social is so um, it's second nature. It's it's just it wasn't the case when I started in the industry, but but now I think it, it you can bring really a different uh, a different side to things that is a lot more exciting and and looks more like fun, like the stuff that you do for your own you know your your own fun at home. So um, I think there's there's an opportunity there to bring this up and and make the profession you know. Um, uh, uh, something that is that is more exciting to uh, to the younger generation, but uh, I hope that the, the schools step up step up and really think about it in that way as well. Uh, but you do need people to be curious and to and to really want it as well. Absolutely, stay curious whatever you do. Okay, we're wrapped up all these questions and all these points. I think we have so much more to go. We're going to keep talking about these having our conversations and just one last remark as we close thank you so much Katel, and thanks so much adrian Katel, your last thought on this what can you sum it up in like two or three words what is your advice i i, I think we've we've talked about this remain curious uh, uh try to adapt um look for information try new things um, it's going to be a little bit bumpy, um, but uh, I think, again, there's a lot that makes you as a translator really unique um, and, and, and really understand your value there, because 
um, I, that's something that generally the profession maybe is not so good at, at doing, but translators themselves are not so good at doing. Uh, I, I, I remember some conversations around people who wanted a different job title or whatever. Translator is a beautiful thing, and and but really understand what that what that means and 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 seek you know uh, um, new new um, new ideas and new ways to to show that the, those skills. Oh, Thanks. fantastic! Thank you, Ketel. Adrian, your short take. My keywords would be added value. I think you need to find your added value, become the best in it in this very small niche and just sell yourself as the expert and then you will be needed. Whatever happens to the language industry, uh, I know I will be here in any in any capacity somehow. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and everyone check the chat. It uh, looks like uh, we have the... YouTube channel from Adrian. Yeah, the Freelance Verse. So everyone, oh, nice. Thank yourself. you, Rodrigo. Yeah, isn't that great? I, I love your content and, and so prolific. And Katel, we, we really appreciate your years of wisdom and all of the, the wonderful industries you've, you've been out there and trailblazing in globalization. Everybody, this is it's hard Thank to you. say goodbye, but it's about time <laughs> to do so. Katel, were you going to say something? No, I was just going to say thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for everybody who was here and asked questions uh, or didn't. Uh, really appreciate your, your time. Thank you. Fantastic. All right, everybody. Take care. We'll see you another time. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.